Hi, my name is Amy Proal. I'm the President and Chief Scientific Officer of PolyBio Research Foundation. Today, I'll be talking about SARS-CoV-2 reservoir, a potential driver of inflammation and other disease mechanisms in long COVID or PASC. We recently published as a group this paper in Nature Immunology, a position paper called SARS-CoV-2 Reservoir in Post-Acute Cycle of COVID or PASC. And the group of authors on this paper are our Long COVID Research Consortium team. They're a group organized by our nonprofit, Poly Bio Research Foundation. And they're working at different academic institutions in a collaborative fashion to study the persistence of the SARS-CoV-2 virus or SARS-CoV-2 Reservoir in patients with Long COVID or PASC. Overall, we wrote the paper so that we could uh, delineate mechanisms by which a SARS-CoV-2 reservoir could contribute to PACs and also delineate current evidence for SARS-CoV-2 reservoir and PACs. And finally, to delineate research priorities for the field and to emphasize the need for clinical trials of antivirals or immunomodulators or other drugs that might be able to clear a, a SARS-CoV-2 reservoir in patients with long COVID or PASC. This is how we define SARS-CoV-2 reservoir in the paper. We say some individuals with PASC may not fully clear the SARS-CoV-2 virus after acute infection. Instead, replicating virus and or viral RNA, potentially capable of being translated to produce viral proteins, persist in tissue as a reservoir. This table in our paper delineates studies that have found SARS-CoV-2 RNA or protein in samples months and in some cases over a year after acute COVID. And some of these studies were not designed to measure PAC symptoms, but nevertheless, they do provide evidence that SARS-CoV-2 is capable of persistence in numerous reservoir sites, including sites in the central nervous system. In several of the studies, SARS-CoV-2 RNA or protein was found in the tissue of a post-COVID individual, but not in their blood. And in nearly all studies where SARS-CoV-2 RNA and protein were found in patient samples post-COVID, the subjects did not test, they tested negative for the virus via standard nasal PCR testing. And it follows that SARS-CoV-2 reservoir is a largely tissue-based phenomenon. Now there's unfortunately no PAC specific autopsy program, which is actually something we, we hope to fix. But for the meantime, evidence for SARS-CoV-2 reservoir and PACs comes from tissue biopsy studies, from studies of SARS-CoV-2 proteins in plasma, and from studies using features of the adaptive immune response to infer the presence of a SARS-CoV-2 reservoir in patient tissue. The tissue biopsies studies include, uh, there's a number of them now, this very interesting preprint by Tim Hendrick and Michael Peluso and Stephen Deeks at UCSF. They collected colon tissue from patients via biopsy from patients with long COVID or PASC. And they were able to identify spike SARS-CoV-2 spike RNA in all five of the uh, tissue samples collected from all five of the long COVID or past patients in their study from 158 to 676 days following initial COVID symptom onset with signal primarily observed in cells located within the lamin and propria. And these five long COVID or past patients who had virus in their colon tissue were part of a larger cohort of patients who also underwent high resolution PET imaging to identify T cell activation throughout their bodies. Specifically, the team used a novel radio tracer 18FFARG, a highly selective tracer that allows for anatomical quantification of activated T lymphocytes. In patients with PAC symptoms, they observed higher tracer uptake in the spinal cord, in hyalur lymph nodes, and in colon rectal wall in participants. And we don't know if this T cell activation is occurring due to uh, viral reservoir activity. It could be. Um, but it, overall, it's interesting to think about the possibility that reservoirs of SARS-CoV-2 in, in patients with PACs might extend to body sites such as the spinal cord. This is a team that found evidence of SARS-CoV-2 RNA and protein in the epithelial layer and lamin appropria of fungiform papillae tissue, which is basically tongue taste bud tissue, from all individuals in the study who are experiencing taste deficits from 6 to 63 weeks after testing PCR positive for COVID. There was increased presence of cytotoxic T cells and some cytokines in the fungiform papillae of the majority of the patients. So in this case, reservoir was accompanied by some inflammation. This is a similar study which found SARS-CoV-2 RNA or protein detected in olfactory mucosa samples 110 to 196 days after symptom onset in three patients with negative nasal pharyngeal swab RT-PCR but ongoing loss of smell. 
So loss of taste and loss of smell now directly connected to SARS-CoV-2 reservoir or persistent uh, loss of smell in patients with PASC. Now there are other studies, multiple studies that have identified SARS-CoV-2 proteins in PASC plasma months or even after a year post COVID. This protein is likely derived from past tissue reservoir sites, but leaks into the circulation via exosome or extracellular vesicle transport. For example, the two studies on the lower part of my slide found SARS-CoV-2 proteins, including spike in patient exosomes or extracellular vesicles. Now the identification of SARS-CoV-2 protein in past plasma samples 12 or 16 months after post COVID uh, that happened in one study suggests that some PACs or long COVID individuals may harbor replicating virus. However, thus far, levels of protein detected differ widely among long COVID or PAC studies, from over 60% of patients harboring protein in plasma to around 24% in a poster presented by a team uh, by UCSF. That was their number. Now, some of this variability could reflect differences in SARS-CoV-2 translational activity. This is supported by the fact that there are PAX cases in which spike or other SARS-CoV-2 proteins were identified in plasma of the same individual at some time points, but not others. For example, I took this image from David Walt and team's first Samoa study of spike protein in PAX blood, and they were able to collect longitudinal samples on 12 participants. If you look at the, the table here, you can see the protein was identified sometimes at one time point in the patient, but not at a different time point, but then at a different time point it was. And what this means is it might be possible that SARS-CoV-2 in a reservoir could have periods of inactivity and resume protein production or replication at other times, such as when immune control is altered. Now, the failure to detect SARS-CoV-2 protein in the plasma of some long COVID or PAX patients could also be impacted by a number of other variables. A person with PAX could harbor SARS-CoV-2 reservoir, for example, in a body site like the brain or in a certain nerve where protein is just less likely to leak into the circulation where it can be measured. Also, protein that does get into the blood could be bound by antibody. It could be trapped in nets. It could be inside macrophage where it can't be measured by assays. It could be inside a fibrin amyloid microclot, which is something I'll explain soon. And the assays and sample preparation and storage protocols being used by teams now measuring SARS-CoV-2 protein in long COVID impacts blood differ among teams somewhat. So standardization of those protocols will be helpful moving forward to re really figure out this question. Now, there are also studies I mentioned in which features of the adaptive immune response are being used to infer the presence of a SARS-CoV-2 reservoir in tissue. That includes this study. I don't have time to go through all of them. Here's an example. In this study, PAX patients with severe acute disease demonstrated a significant decrease in blood of CD8 beta-7 integrin T cells compared to those with mild severity suggesting the redistribution of the CD8 beta-7 beta, beta integrin T cells into the mucosa, potentially due to the persistence of SARS-CoV-2 in mucosal tissue. Consistent with viral persistence in the mucosa was that in PAX patients, they detected higher levels of IgA against the SARS-CoV-2S and N proteins when compared to controls, a difference that was more prominent in patients who had severe acute disease. This is an interesting study in which the team collected tonsil and adenoid tissue from children undergoing routine surgery to get their tonsils removed. And they found SARS-CoV-2 nucleocapsid RNA in 15 out of 22 tonsil and seven out of nine adenoid tissue samples, despite negative nasal fear and geo swab PCR at the time of surgery. And in four cases where tissue was examined, the last positive nasal swab PCR in the child had been between 100 to 300 days before surgery. Overall, viral RNA copies significantly correlated with the percentages of S1 receptor binding domain B cells among germinal center B cells and tonsil tissue, suggesting that SARS-CoV-2 antigen persistence contributed to prolonged lymphoid and germinal center responses documented in the children. Now, this is an interesting study because these children did not necessarily have PAC symptoms. It's possible that since they were going undergoing tonsil surgery, in some cases due to breathing issues, that maybe some of them did struggle with issues with persistent virus. But that was not documented. For all we know, they were asymptomatic. And this reflects what's being found in a number of studies with viral persistence. 
the control subjects in studies often sometimes also have signs of viral persistence. For example, in the studies that were looking for SARS-CoV-2 protein in long COVID or past blood, a portion of control subjects often also have protein. The control subjects have less protein than the PAX patients, but some of them still harbor it. And that means that some people who are asymptomatic may still be dealing with viral persistence. Now, there could be a number of reasons that require further study on why some people who still harbor SARS-CoV-2 RNA protein might develop symptoms and others not. These include location of infection and viral dissemination within the host. They include transcriptional and translational activity of SARS-CoV-2 RNA. Human genome variants, HLA haplotypes might influence this, and also variation in the immune response due to other infections. Overall, however, I've had some people say to me, well, look, if patients with long COVID PASC uh, harbor viral RNA and protein, but so do controls, then maybe the whole thing doesn't matter as much. And I, I totally disagree. I actually think it's just more concerning that controls also sometimes show signs of persistence because we know with other viruses and with other pathogens that genetic material or the pathogen may persist in a dormant or silent form for periods of time, but could drive disease at a later date. And right now, Alzheimer's disease, for example, and amyloid beta plaque formation is being tied to the activity of persistent viruses. A lot of chronic diseases are being tied to persistent viral activity. So it's disconcerting that we're actually seeding children with the genetic material and protein of SARS-CoV-2, even if it might be silent at this particular point in time. Now, I will, in this part of the talk, talk about mechanisms of disease by which a SARS-CoV-2 reservoir could drive PAC symptoms. This is a table from our paper that goes through some of the central mechanisms. They include the possibility that SARS-CoV-2 in a reservoir, the RNA and protein, can engage host pattern recognition receptors to modulate the immune response and drive cytokine production and inflammation. Also, repeated recognition of persistent protein by the host adaptive immune cells can drive in response to a reservoir, could drive immune mediator production, exhaustion, and or alter differentiation of virus-specific T cells and B cells over time. And I gave you a few examples of that, and there have been a few studies that have found signs of T cell exhaustion in patients with long COVID or PASC. Now, SARS-CoV-2 proteins associated with reservoir could also modulate host metabolic, genetic, and epigenetic factors to drive chronic symptoms in the absence of overt inflammation and cytopathology. I think that's really interesting and important to consider because we might not find overt inflammation uh, near SARS-CoV-2 RNA and protein in every past sample, but that doesn't mean that the RNA and the virus uh, or the virus is not driving disease. There's many other mechanisms by which that can occur. Also, SARS-CoV-2 spike in S1 protein in a reservoir could contribute to fibrin amyloid microclot formation or vasculature damage. This is a study done by Vicia Pretorius and team at Stellenbach University over a year ago now at least, and they found fibrin amyloid microclot deposits in the blood of patients with long COVID or past. These clots are really resistant to breakdown or fibrinolysis. And in a separate study, they showed that addition of the S1 SARS-CoV-2 protein to healthy platelet plas pleroplasma could induce fibrinogen similar to what they're finding in the clots. So these clots can be directly connected to reservoir and especially the shedding of protein into the blood via exosome transport. Also, SARS-CoV-2 reservoir could downregulate the immune system or the immune response, including interferon signaling, in a manner that might facilitate the reactivation of latent pathogens such as herpes viruses. And a number of teams are finding herpes virus reactivation in patients with long COVID or PASC, for example, Epstein-Barr virus reactivation. And while that doesn't have to be connected to reservoir in the same patient, as we say in our paper, it's interesting to study the relationship between reactivation of latent pathogens and possibly persistence of SARS-CoV-2 in the same individual. Also, SARS-CoV-2 reservoir and associated immune dysregulation can facilitate microbiome dysbiosis. For example, in the gut or the mouth, let's say the patient does not clear the virus from those environments. Low-level inflammation in those sites could begin to throw off the collective balance of the ecosystems, the microbiome ecosystems in those communities, leading to the growth of opportunistic pathogens or pathobionts. Also, the inflammation could contribute to increased epithelial barrier permeability in those sites. Also, antibodies created in response to a SARS-CoV-2 
two reservoir could potentially cross-react with host proteins. There could be molecular mimicry type phenomenon and other types of autoimmune cycle that could result from, from SARS-CoV-2 reservoir. And now I'm going to quickly try to pull some of these trends together just for interest. Let's because they they all connect. And it's interesting to see how a SARS-CoV-2 reservoir can explain a lot of the other findings in the PACS field and is actually a very good model for connecting many different, what can seem like disparate findings and PACs into a consistent series of events. It, here's an example where a patient could harbor SARS-CoV-2 in the gut. So this is an image taken from Tim Hendrick and team's preprint where they found SARS-CoV-2 uh, spike RNA in the colon tissue of patients with long COVID or past. So patient has it, the reservoir in, it, in the colon. Now, that may lead to increased intestinal barrier permeability. That would be supported by this study done by Alessio Fasano and team at Harvard Medical School in children with multi-system inflammatory syndrome, which is a, long, a condition along the Pax long COVID spectrum. They found SARS-CoV-2 RNA in the stool of children was associated with upregulated zonulin, which is a biomarker of intestinal permeability. And most of those same children had SARS-CoV-2 spike protein in blood as measured by David Walt's sensitive Samoa assay. So the overall takeaway is it seems like SARS-CoV-2 reservoir in the gut can drive that permeability that allows the spike protein to leak into the blood, potentially via exosome transport, where it can then begin to cause many other problems. This is a study documenting the spike protein in the blood of patients with long COVID or PASC. From there, as I mentioned before, we might get seeding of these fibrin amyloid microclots. This is the paper in which the Pretorius team took S1, put it into healthy platelet-poor plasma and showed that fibrinogen resistant to fibrinolysis formed. So this is a clotting sequelae that could occur from reservoir. Then clotting and the signaling cascades that begin once clotting processes are beginning to occur in blood can leads to platelet hyperactivation. And indeed, platelets have receptors that recognize a wide range of bacterial proteins. So spike protein will activate platelets likely in and of its own right. And we do, a number of teams we're working with are seeing platelet activation in patients with long COVID and PASC. Now, that platelet activation might also impact nutricellular extra trap formation in these patients or be associated with it. This is an image from my colleague, Mike ben at Harvard Medical School. They are using microscopy here. The blue on the right is a blue stain that shows extracellular DNA denoting nets or neutrophil extracellular traps in the plasma of a PAX patient. And the uh, like fuchsia fluorescent stain is a marker of platelet activation. And you can see that in this person's blood, the nets co-localize with the platelets. So there's interactions there, and those interactions could lead to yet more inflammation that could potentially damage the vasculature, leading to endothelial cell dysfunction, which is another issue increasingly documented in patients with long COVID or PASC. Now, if the endothelial function is dysregulated and the vasculature is not in good shape and fibrin amyloid microclots might be blocking the ability of blood to perfuse the small peripheral nerves of the body so that they get they do not get enough oxygen. Those little peripheral nerves may die off or become diminished. And that could contribute to small fiber neuropathy, which has also been documented in patients with long COVID or PASC. Last, we are also interested, and we do write about this in our paper, about how dysregulated vagus nerve and brainstem signaling impacted by SARS-CoV-2 reservoir in a number of body sites could lead to symptoms of long COVID or PASC. The vagus nerve is an important nerve that innervates every major trunk organ of the body. And then it connects at the back of the brain to the dorsal brainstem. And nuclei in the dorsal brainstem control the feeling of being sick and nauseous, the sickness behavior response, which are controlled by the nucleus of the solitary tract, NTS, and the area postrema, AP. Inflammatory pain signaling is controlled by the dorsal reticular nucleus, or DRT. Autonomic functions are controlled by nuclei such as the dorsal motor vagus and nucleus ambiguous. Overall, what happens is that if inflammation from reservoir in a body site, let's say like the gut, conveys a pro-inflammatory signal to the brainstem, it can throw off the precise signaling of those nuclei, leading to an increase in sickness, pain, nausea, and autonomic symptoms. And one way in which that could really occur is if the vagus nerve were directly infected. 
This is an autopsy study, which found SARS-CoV-2 RNA in vagus nerve samples obtained from severe acute COVID patients, and direct infection of the nerve was accompanied by inflammation. So SARS-CoV-2 can infect the vagus nerve, and it's very interesting to think of the vagus nerve as a reservoir site. I'll stop there. Our paper does have major opportunities of research investigation into reservoir delineated. We need a lot more research on this point. And also, we need more clinical trials. We There are some Paxlovid trials underway, but we also need more treatment trials that may require combination therapies in which different antivirals or modulating drugs are used synergistically or for longer periods of time to achieve efficacy in potentially clearing a SARS-CoV-2 reservoir. Thank you.